Joining me now here on the Knicks Film School pregame show for the fourth and most likely final time in what's felt like the last two months, the Knicks will be taking on the Miami Heat. Finally, they don't have to go down to (laughs) South Beach to do it. And we'll see if it's as eventful as the previous three meetings are concerned. Um, We'll talk about whether or not uh, this game will have as much weight as the breaking news came down about an hour before we're recording that Jimmy Butler will not play against the Raptors. My guess is this that this so that way he can play against the Knicks at full strength, but we'll get into that in a second. But as far as the Knicks are concerned, one of the biggest regular season games that they've had in the last, uh, let's call it two decades. Mm. And then we'll take on the Miami Heat with the five seeds still up for grabs. And joining me to talk all about it, you could see him on the sidelines or on your television in South Florida for Bally Sports Heat. You can also listen to him on the podcast, uh, Miami Mic'd Up. I saw a bunch of his clips as a baseball <laughs> fan, for those of you know, as a big Mets fan, when he had like the whole Marlins team just on his podcast, Miami Mic'd Up. Yep. <laughs> and then, of course, Knicks fans, do not yell at me. Jer Bear from the Dan Levitard show with Stu Gatz. Please don't yell uh, at me either. Yes, yeah, don't Please yell don't. at him either. Jeremy Tache, welcome to the Knicks Film School pregame show. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be with you and your lovely audience. Uh, <laughs> and and seriously excited to talk some heat Knicks here. And and yeah, grateful that you had me. So thanks thanks for uh, bringing me in. So let's start at the top with the news that just broke that Jimmy Butler will not be playing in a game tonight against Toronto. And I, I usually start with that. For those on YouTube, they usually see at the top at the bottom when we're recording, so they right. know this is being recorded before the Heat have taken on the. Raptors and the result has come through. So we don't know whether the Knicks will be up three full games in the standings or whether the Heat have cut it back down to two. Um, But with Jimmy Butler not playing, do you get this sense that this is load management for the sake of... It's back soreness is the reason. He was on the the Ira Winderman um, Mm -hmm. reported this that he wasn't even on the injury report this morning. Mm -hmm. But do you get the sense that this is a precautionary thing because they have a game against the Knicks on Wednesday, or is this a lingering thing that there's a chance he could miss the game against the Knicks on Wednesday? Yeah. So I haven't heard uh, before this moment, and we are recording this at four o'clock on Tuesday. Um, I hadn't heard anything. I, I believe this was neck soreness for Jimmy is, is what it was finally ultimately, you mm. know, uh, turned in as here. And I hadn't heard anything about that specifically. So it does sort of make you feel like, could be a load management sort of decision, whether that's specifically taken on the Knicks or if we see that from Jimmy sort of down the stretch here, if the Heat maybe have decided, you know what, we're hopeful to to even get out of the play in. But there's a chance even if the Heat play really great basketball, the Heat could beat the Knicks in this huge game upcoming on Wednesday. The Heat could win a lot of games down the stretch and simply due to tiebreakers with the Nets and the, enough distance between them and the Knicks right now, they could still end up in the play in tournament. So would I be shocked if Jimmy's looking at this game specifically against Toronto, a team that right now they have a three game cushion against and maybe he's saying, you know what, this this is the right night for if my body's not feeling quite right to take this night off and go into the Knicks game feeling fresh, feeling ready for obviously one that can move us up in the standings, not necessarily a game that's fighting somebody off. Yeah, I think that's that's totally possible. Jimmy's a guy that, you know, even when he's really banged up, you know. I'm not ever that concerned because he's a really tough physical guy and he takes care of his body particularly well as compared to, you know, all these NBA guys who already do. I want to follow up on that because you have more access than some of the other guests that I've had on here. And you've obviously interacted with Jimmy on a on a more regular basis than I would have um, sure. throughout your time, uh, throughout your work. Um, because he plays such a physical style and because he's a player that, you know, you think of uh, it getting you're in for a tough matchup when you're facing a Jimmy Butler. Um, I imagine he's injured all the time or playing Mm -hmm. with some injuries all the time. So from what you've seen and from your interactions with the team and specifically with Jimmy, how healthy has he been this season? So he's been really healthy. Um, I think that what's been great about Jimmy and I, I let me say that with the caveat of like, because he's such a tough physical player, of course, he's always banged and bruised in a way that a player who is, is taking as much contact, who's sometimes getting to the free throw line, 10 or 11 different individual trips to the free throw line, let, let alone 10 or 11 free throws. Um, that guy's always going to be, be a little, you know, banged up, but 
in the reality, all I ever see is a guy who looks fresh, who I know going into this season, you know, the Heat saw the the way that the wear and tear has sort of worked for this team going into the postseason, including last year where, you know, they going up against Boston sort of ran out of steam at the end. Um, you know, in years before, obviously they ran out of steam against Milwaukee, you know, in the, in the bubble, they got to the final. So this is a team that's been trying to sort of manage the wear and tear of what the last few years of the NBA has been. That's kind of all players, right? Like basically since the bubble, there's been more basketball played in a three year stretch than ever before for any NBA player. So this load management really is more of just like, These are guys trying to get to the finish line. And so Jimmy Butler came into this season looking at a team that was running it back, looked with himself, with Coach Spolstra, with the training staff of the Miami Heat, including the individual trainers that work with Jimmy. And they basically laid out a game plan for what his season would look like, the type of minutes he'd be playing. If you look at it, even in the big games, Jimmy's not coming back until there's like six minutes left in the fourth quarter, seven or six minutes left in the fourth quarter in close games, in big games. They've really given him a very specific regimen for this season, the type of minutes he would play, the amount of games he would play, hopefully, should he be 100% healthy all year. And I think he's hit a lot of those benchmarks. I think he wishes he would have played in a few more games. There's been times where he's actually missed time with injury, but he's a guy who right now, he said it like, I don't really start getting revved and ready to go until after the all-star break. So he's someone who I think in a lot of ways is sort of reaching his peak physically like he loves getting to the foul line and feeling like he can do that going into the playoffs because he knows how important that'll be so then with that in mind that they had a a mapped out plan specifically for how many minutes he'd play how many games he would play and i guess more specifically and like tibbs talks about this all the time the the leverage of the minutes that you're playing um with the way the heat season has gone i how important is it for them to get to the five seed? Is it because uh, just from the people I've talked to, we talked to John, John Carlo Navas who's become a, yeah. a, a friend of the pod with the Miami heat. Love beat. him talking to Zaslow last week as well. It does seem like, like the plan while you don't want to play in the play and you still get two home games to win one. If you're the seven seed. Mm-hmm. And then I get the sense there's no fear of Philadelphia or Boston. So, while it's a very important game to the Knicks, I personally want the Donovan Mitchell matchup. I just I want the smoke. Right. But right. as far as the Heat are concerned, is will they take be a little more cautious because the playoffs are what matter more? Yeah. I, I, look, this and you've seen it from this franchise kind of nonstop. They're a compete until the final whistle type of mm-hmm. organization. Um, I would never, ever view them as a team that's like taking a game lightly. Their whole thing constantly is we have enough. You know, that Spo's big in a pregame press conference will walk in and literally it's like Jamal Kane and Orlando Robinson are starting and he's like, we have enough. You know, it's it's one of those where that's sort of their mentality always. And I think they're always trying to compete on the same token. I don't think there's any fear. Like, I, I, I think that this team has over the, with this sort of core faced all sorts of different iterations of all of these teams ahead of them. They have faced the Celtics and Jason Tatum and whatever has surrounded him. They have faced Joel Embiid and the 76ers and whatever has surrounded him. They have faced Milwaukee and taken down Milwaukee in a year where Giannis was the MVP. I think their view of it is, yeah, of course, we'd like to get to the five seed because number one, that guarantees us a space where it's, you know, you don't have to worry about a couple of extra games where theoretically things could go wrong. Injuries could occur or you could lose because it's basketball and that happens. Um, and this is not a good enough team to think that they can take Toronto, for example, just lightly just because. Right. Um, they can't do that. These games are all close every game all year long. Uh, when you look at it, the five seed matters in in that way but i don't think there's a of course they'd like to play cleveland over you know one of those other teams there is a significant drop off but this team doesn't really have fear jimmy butler doesn't operate that way and i think the surrounding players feed off of that like this team you know jimmy butler and tyler hero have just an insane amount of confidence each one of them in their own different ways and bam out bio does as well and there's kind of energy that's fed from there to all these other guys who have been willed into being nba players at the level that they are all these undrafted players 
So then do you get the sense that regardless of what playoff seating they are, this team, this organization expects to make a deep run in the playoffs this year, despite how up and down this regular season has been? I think it w- I think the big thing is that they're always expecting themselves to compete at their best possible level. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that, look, all of these guys have been on now championship level teams. They've played on teams that are championship level consistent. Even last year, they were a shot away. A Jimmy Butler three pointer that banged off the rim away from going to the finals again for the second time in three years. Like this team is a championship level team when you think about it from that perspective. And so I think they know what level of consistency both offensively and defensively is necessary to be a championship team. And I think if they're realistic with themselves, which I think most of these guys are, they know they haven't been that yet. But I think there is this belief of we've done it before. We could do it again. And in the last few weeks, although up and down and inconsistent, more flashes of the great version of this team. Mm -hmm. You know, the Knicks just saw it like more flashes of the best version of what this team is that can compete with just about anybody, a team that beat the nuggets, not all that long ago. And so on the same token, you know, they'll drop a game to the Pistons or they'll drop a game like these inexplicably bad losses where you're, you're shaking your head and not understanding. And that started back early in the year when they lost to a tanking Spurs team and everyone was just looking around like what's going on. Um, This team is so volatile. You could tell me, Hey, they end up in the play in and they actually lose back to back games and they're out because they couldn't shoot and they couldn't stop anybody. Or you could tell me they play their way all the way to the five seed in the final week. They beat Cleveland and then they go at least have a puncher's chance with Milwaukee. Like I and I believe you no matter what you said because of how strange this year has been. See, you're hitting on how I've processed the Miami Heat season all year where Mm -hmm. it's like and I said this to to Zazla last week. I'm so ready to be like afraid of the heat in the sense of what they were last year. Right. And I've seen the shooting numbers that have improved. I've seen Jimmy activate this mode that he always goes to earlier this season than I think he has Mm -hmm. in years past. And last Wednesday against the Knicks was like in a moment, in a vacuum, a wake up call of like, okay, this team should be feared. Next Wednesday is going to be a dog fight. That's what I thought. But then this Brooklyn game happens on Udonis Haslam night. And I'm like, you lost a little brother by how much at home right. in your building? So it's I'm back and forth on this Heat team. And I'm wondering if so, what would you deem a successful ending to this season? Like, obviously, a championship is the the I, I, successful I, one. But like, yeah. is it you make the, they're the six seed and they take Philly or Boston to six or seven? Man, I, I'll tell you, I, I think that. I think that in their minds, like it would still take winning a playoff series to feel Mm. like it was successful. I think they would accept the fact that, all right, we got to the six, which was hard fought given all these different things that happened all year. And we're glad we fought hard against a good team. But like, I don't think any of these guys would be satisfied with that. Like, I don't think that like, oh, cool. We made a little run at the end of the year to not be in the play in is good enough for what their standard is for themselves. Um, And that goes up and down the roster. Like that includes the guys who are these undrafted players who have now become key role players. Like their expectation of themselves was more than this. Um, And so, no, I mean like with the heat, like it it sounds like a lot, but a successful season for the heat always in their minds is just, it's winning the championship. Now, obviously last year was a successful season. They were one seed that was also a shot away from making it to the finals. Uh, They've had, you know, 2020, obviously a successful season, despite the fact that they didn't win the whole thing. But I think for, for me, like if you're asking my opinion, Mm -hmm. my opinion now based off of like where we stand today, a, a, a successful season would be like an upset in a, in a first round. And I'd be like, yeah, you know what? That was a, that was a very successful season given what they were. If they lose in the first round, it'll be all right. That's kind of what we saw all year long. Was it was an inconsistent team that probably will take Philly or Boston or whoever they get to six or seven games, because that's what this team does. They don't make it easy. I know, you know, friend of friend, and I don't know, God, he's probably hated because New York too, but Mike sure 
who is like oh, a no. friend of Levitard. He's I'm a benign. Fan of Mike Shore. I'll I say love that. that guy. I'm a fan of Mike Shore. I'm yeah. a I'm a gigantic fan, and yes. one day he'll he'll know that. Um, but <laughs> but he's still saying like I fear the Heat, not even because I necessarily think they'll win, just because I think they'll beat the living hell out of us in seven games, and that won't be good for the next round. And like more likely than not, that's that could be the destiny for this team. Um, but again, I can constantly convince myself. Jimmy Butler's playing potentially the best basketball of his career. Tyler Hero is legitimately statistically the best clutch player in the game, which is insane, but he is. He's hit more threes in the fourth quarter than anybody in the league. He's hit more go-ahead buckets with a minute to go uh, in the game than anybody in the league in the most in 10 years. Like, he's great. And Bam is having the best season of his career. So you have those three. If the role players can shoot 2% better from three, all of a sudden you're like, oh, we could do anything. And so I think that's kind of like this thing that everybody's been waiting to ignite. And you're right. Last Wednesday felt like that game. It felt like that game. And then instantly by Saturday night, you're like, what? What happened? It it, it really in all year long, it's been these polarizing up and down. So it's it's one of the strangest seasons I can remember in heat history. Do you get a sense like I, I know how the fan base will feel because that's that's mostly who I've dealt with. Will the sure. organization, the Miami Heat, did they take the Nick rivalry personally at all? I know it's been twenty years, but there's there's still the Riley factor of it all. Obviously, Jimmy and Julius Randle got into it last last Wednesday, and sure. obviously, like Randle hit the shot a month ago. So, <sighs> like that is a thing that the Knicks have to be on their radar. Just losing. The five seed, like if you lost to Brooklyn, it's like, well, they they had this big head start and sure. then Katie and Kyrie left and you just couldn't catch them. Losing it to the Knicks, did they take that personally or just in it specifically would that add to the disappointment if they were to lose tomorrow night? I think it would be even more. It, it's more of like a if it was between the six and the seven seed where mm. it was like legit stakes of who was going to make it to the quote unquote playoffs and who wasn't. There'd be a little more sting there. You know, if the Heat fall all the way down to seven and the Knicks are five, it doesn't it doesn't hit quite the same way. But I do think like a loss in the garden that kind of cements you in the play in would certainly hurt. Um, You know, Heat Knicks does mean something Mm -hmm. like there. There's a history to it. It does mean something. Um, It means different things to both fan bases. Um, And understandably, like the last couple of decades have been weird since Heat Knicks was really Heat Knicks. Um, and the you Knicks, don't say, Jeremy. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be nice. I look, man, We're I'm well trying to win over an audience here. Me. I'm trying to win over an audience. And, uh-huh. and so, no, but ultimately, like, because the last couple of decades have been what they've been, there's not that same, like, you know, anger necessarily. But, like, I do know how frustrating it is because... There's so many New Yorkers in South Florida. And so there's so many dang Knicks fans at, at heat games, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it does make it makes the energy different. There's not a lot of teams that that come to Miami the same way. Right. No different than like there's a bunch of Jets fans at Dolphins games and there's a bunch of Mets fans at Marlins games. Mm -hmm. Like there's a bunch of New Yorkers who are transplants down here. And so ultimately they come out with their jerseys and they're ready to kind of rock also. And so it creates a fun energy in the building. That was my um, what was supposed to be. I don't know. My potentially might be my last game on the sideline for the regular season. And I was so excited that it was Heat Knicks. And that was like at the beginning of the season. I was like, oh, man, I, you know, I don't know what that game's going to mm-hmm. be. I don't know where either of our seasons are going to be. And the closer we got, I was like, oh, man, I'm getting a Heat Knicks game, like a real one, you know, like where where there's stakes behind it. And we haven't had so much of that. And and the way Spolstra spoke pregame about it, like you can tell these guys care about Heat Knicks um, in, in a way, because I think there's just if you play for the heat, you respect the history of the organization. Um, and it, it's kind of ingrained into you, the sort of heat culture thing. And, and Spolstra is such a child of Riley um, that all of that is sort of ingrained into the DNA of the team. Yeah. The, 
So first of all, I'll start here. I went to Miami for the first time over the summer uh, for a vacation and attended my first Mets Marlins game at Lone Depot Park with Mets jersey and Met hat. And you are correct. That was a lot of Mets fans. Oh, City Field South. If if I do so myself. Um, Yeah, if certainly, certainly in those games, certainly in those games, Uh, got a ninth inning chant going, the standing ovation chant ready for the Mm -hmm. final out. So um, I was able to enjoy. So I I understand the. The frustration isn't just coming from the fact that like the heat Nick rivalry, it's the the New York Miami frustration of like you've all moved to down. You've migrated yeah, south. Especially the last couple of years, man. <laughs> it's been that yeah. way for the last couple of decades. Yeah. But the last couple of years, there's been even more of it. So now I was on a I took a, a train down, like there's not a lot of public transportation. It's a private train, whatever. It's a whole thing. Mm-hmm. With Bright line. It's a thing in South Florida. And I, um it's cool. I really like it. We're trying to we're trying with transportation being better than just cars. Anywho, listen, I someone who takes MTA Long Island Railroad all the time, right. I understand the frustration with well, public transit. Transit, but, but no, but 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 the point being, I'm trying. So I'm getting on the train and mm-hmm. I'm going down to Miami to work the game and I'm looking around me on on this bright line and I'm looking around. And I'm like, man, this sucks. It's like mostly Knicks fans. <laughs> it's, mostly Knicks fans. <laughs> like it's mostly Knicks fans. And that was just going down like from Fort Lauderdale or whatever. And, you know, we we happen to in Miami be more of a late arriving crowd. So, you know, Miami showed up. That was definite. I mean, it was certainly there was a smattering of Knicks fans ultimately at the game. It was dominated by heat fans and you could feel it i'm sure you could feel it watching on tv um but it was it's a fun environment it's just fun it's fun when you get get teams in cities that have sort of an inherent like there's something between them because of of multiple sports and new york miami gets to be one of those right like we have heat knicks theoretically mets marlins is a rivalry it should be in some capacity you you use Um, the right word theoretically yeah theoretically and whenever the marlins are good those games with the Mets, like in Mm -hmm. 03 those games with the mets were always fun it's just you have that and then obviously the jets and the dolphins despise each other Listen, um, well, the Jets Dolphin thing could get really fun, especially yeah. if the Jets get Rodgers and oh. whatever's about to happen with the Dolphin quarterback. It's going to be fun. So that should be you guys have Mike White. The games that Mike White oh, plays against Mike the Jets White, man. will matter I played, to me at least. I will tell you, I played, I played high school baseball against Mike White. Really? Like, yeah, I've known. I we like played travel baseball against each other. That's he's right, from he's down here. He's from South Florida. That's yeah, right. He's from here. That. So it's yeah. pretty cool. It's a homecoming for him. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for him. I have, I, I am not friends with him, but I have like a lot of. I have some friends who are very good friends with him and are very happy that he's home. So, well, enjoy your homecoming, Mike White. I will do my very best to enjoy Aaron Rodgers. Um, and as far as like, look, that's okay the, for you. I was about to say, I think I I'll think figure out, okay figure out a way to enjoy Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Um, you mentioned like the Marlins Mets rivalry, like as somebody who's been a Mets fan since the nineties, I mm-hmm. remember the last regular season game of 2007. I was in the building for the last ever game at Chase stadium in which mm. the Marlins closed the building yep. and the Mets were eliminated from yep. the playoff contention. So, <laughs> so you get it. Yeah. I get it. Believe right. me, the New York South Florida rivalry is it's absolutely fun. there. You also add in what else is going on in South Florida and the fact that there's a very realistic chance that the two teams in the national championship game for college basketball on the men's side could be like it's Southern nuts. Florida schools between FAU and the University of Miami. And like you just you talked about the Dolphins and the leap they took and trading for Jalen Ramsey and getting Tyreek Hill last year. And who knows if they make a bigger splash with Lamar That's Jackson and this this whole Tom Brady thing. Also, the World Baseball Classic, while oh. it was detrimental to me with my closer, I Fair. can't ignore the impact it had globally and the event it became. And then you sneak in with this this Knicks Heat rivalry. It's yep. it's definitely an exciting time to to have this this whole thing come together. For sure. Um, so across the board in South Florida, this is because you mentioned like we're a late arriving crowd. Do they own that that they're a late arriving crowd? And yeah. just just gonna throw it out there. Also, an early leaving crowd. Not an early that's leaving crowd. Not an that, early that's a, crowd. It's an that's overblown. Okay. It's overblown. It's overblown. There were twenty people that walked out. It's not as bad as it looked. Everybody sees the visuals from the night Ray Allen hit the shot, mm-hmm. and then everybody fans trying to get back of in the heat building. fans trying yeah. to get back in the building. Look back at it. It's like 20, 30, 40 people. There were thousands that were still in there. Everybody's okay. cool. And look, yeah, of course. It, the thing about Miami, and it's the thing I've been trying to say about the Marlins, to be honest, and we can relate all of what you just mentioned back together. 
people want an event, right? What what's cool about Heat fandom now is it it started with the 06 team where it was Wade and Shaq, and that that made it an event. But really, obviously, once the big three came along, like every game sells out. Like even even when there's people showing up late, even when some of the people in 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 the rich people seats aren't showing up exactly on time, and so on TV it might look a little more empty. Man, 300 levels always full. You know, the people are are always there, and it's because they turned it into event into an event, and then basically proved, hey, we're gonna keep trying to compete over and over and over again. So you're always gonna see a team that's trying their hardest, and we've made it fun. Right. And so if you look at the rest of South Florida, you know, Dolphins fandom has been there for the long term because they've been around for so long. And you've got all these old fans, like old fans who remember mm. 72, you know, who, who were still around from that. Um, but with the Marlins, it's a really complicated fan base in that, you know, obviously you have the heartbreak that they've had of, of selling off multiple World Series winning teams. Then, you know, building a new stadium and selling off a team right after you've built that new stadium and promised to spend. And, you know, and then, you know, when when Jeter came in, trading away Stanton and Ozuna and Yelich, which which ultimately like I it's complicated, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. But I, I actually still believe all of that was sort of with the right ideology. Um, San Diego Quintana is pretty good. You he's know? In, he's sensational. Yeah. <laughs> and they got him and Jazz both out of it. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, they they did something right. Um, and, and so from here now, like that fan base is in this complicated place of like, all right, so are you going to build a winner? And I think the reality is, is if they do, people will show up because people want an event and Marlins games will be an event. And you look at the reason I mention it is you look at the world baseball classic and you see the energy and yeah, a lot of people traveled from across the country and from across the world to be there for it. But that was full of locals, man. That was a mm-hmm. lot of South Floridians of all sorts of different ethnicities showing up to party at a baseball game. Like it was amazing. And I think that, you know, I'm excited because I do believe that if the Marlins ever do build not just a winner, but a winner that it's it's sh- it's it it's obvious that it's going to stick around, that that's not just like, hey, we're going to try to win once and then sell everything off. It's like, a hey, we're going to be like the Heat who are always trying to compete. You know, once we've reached that space, you know, and no, never with the Mets budget, but <laughs> but but doing the raise thing of yeah. like we're always trying. We're not tanking for talent. We're always trying and figuring it out. I think once that is sustainable and you see the Marlins in the playoffs once or twice, like you will see those fans show up. And and I do believe ultimately Miami fans, no matter the sport, once once you're there, like once once they've been hooked, they're very loyal fans. And and that is why you hear some of the like, you know, trash talk and, and, you know, heat Twitter is nuts. Like, it's awesome and it's crazy and it's fun. You know, like I, I know it's a uh, I know I'm rambling a lot today. No, this, I'm you listening. You're good. good. Mood, man. This good. is fun. Yeah, it's a good time to be in South Florida. You know, I, what I'll say, you, you mentioned the fact that they're an event town and mm-hmm. like from the limit, limited knowledge I have of L.A., and Riley probably brought some of that over. Not with, dissimilar. That's just like that's that was Jerry Buss's whole thing. Is this isn't just a game. This is an event. You know the 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 fact that you went to the the club. I forget the name <laughs> right. of it. That, that Magic used to go to after right. games. You weren't just going to the game. You were going to the event. Lakers, whomever, for sure. And as a result, I feel like Miami has started to be specifically the heat have adopted that similar type of idea. And it helps when you have Dwayne wage, O'Neal, LeBron James, Chris Bosch, and even Jimmy Butler. Um, and I think just, it's a different um, level of dedication from your, just your location, which I just, I recognize it as a, someone yeah. who's lived in New York his whole life. It's just not much to do in the winter except right. be inside. So right. we're going to get really upset about these sports teams mm-hmm. that we watch. Whereas in Miami, if the team's not that good, there's the beach. So yep. like you have that same thing with uh, LA yep. and the California teams as well. So I wonder if that's, that's where some of the trash talk comes. Yeah. I'm like, oh, so you, you, you got reservations on South oh. beach tonight. Enjoy your night, Miami. You know? Right. Well, and what's interesting yeah. about that too. And, 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 you know, creates such an interesting element is in comparison when, when you make it like these three cities and we talk about New York, LA and mm-hmm. Miami, 
Miami really is the split difference and that because all three have their own version of like glitz and glam, right? But Miami's is closer to LA's in that it's, you know, beachy and, Mm -hmm. you know, there's the, the tropics and all of that. But the really interesting element and and look, I don't know as much about L.A., so it's maybe unfair of me to say, but there is this undertone with Miami that I know New Yorkers have the same with, which is like working class town. No matter Mm -hmm. how much glitz and glam, there's a lot of just working class people who really power Miami. Ultimately, Miami is all of these working class folks from all of these different parts of Miami and the overtone of it is like the cocaine 80s and everything that's come from that and so there's this really weird dichotomy that exists between the two and what's crazy is the heat have found their way to hit both Mm -hmm. the game is an event it's a party there's a club everybody's nuts it's glitz and glam there's celebrities on the floor everything's crazy but what's the mantra it's hardest working best condition toughest heat culture right so you're you're doing both you've hit both and it's crazy because the team really is both like the team does exemplify that sort of nitty gritty working class whatever but has been lucky enough that like in its two stars that have been the focal points of the last decade because i i it's Dwayne wade and it's jimmy butler like when you look at because it's obviously lebron is is lebron and it's a whole other animal but the guys that have sort of carried the culture as the stars they're both guys whose games are like get to the line tough defense or you gotta work for it work for it and yet both of them like know how to be a celebrity Mm. you know both of them get it they both got the ads they both are funny and it, it really is amazing that they found this way to like weave through both of those things that miami is it's 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 what makes, I think, the connection to that franchise specifically so special for fans down here. Yeah, the L.A. thing, it's not so much that you don't work hard when you live in L.A. It's like you're chasing a dream. Like the yeah, transplants that thing. live in L.A., you're like a lot of what I've seen in Miami is it's nice to live here. There's no state income tax. And that's right. why a lot of New Yorkers move right. down there, you know. Right. So it's the same mentality. You're not chasing after something. Whereas I'm going to move to Hollywood and to go, chase yeah, a dream. Exactly. Which like more power to you. But as a result, there's just it's different. You yeah, know, it's, it's it, not it makes, neither right or wrong. You know? No, absolutely not. And it, it it it's why all of these cities have their own unique relationships with sports. Yeah, and it, it's what makes all of them what they are and why these rivalries are so cool amongst the three. Like, it's weird because obviously Heat Lakers isn't a rivalry. Mm-mm. And yet when Shaq was here, it was like for a couple of years there. Every Christmas was Heat Lakers. Mm-hmm. And then well, the added part of Riley had to right. have something to do with it, too. Well, of course. You know? And yeah, you got Riley. And then when LeBron was here and, you know, Kobe was still the guy in L.A., Kobe, it was yeah. like, all right, still Christmas games sometimes mm-hmm. with the Heat and Lake, even though it wasn't a rivalry at all. And so, like, even there, we've had that, like, taste and that glimpse of like that that city and those teams mattering to each other. So I don't know. It's 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 fascinating to watch the way they all interact. And it makes for you know, Wednesday night's game, uh, you know, that much more fun. Last thing on this, before I ask my, my last question, the, I just, I don't know how long you've lived. Have you lived in Miami your whole life or South Florida, your whole life? South Florida, my whole life. So I cannot express how miserable a Northeast winter is. (laughs) So like, I'll throw a bone to my brothers up here in Philadelphia, in Boston, where the reason those, these three cities and these three sports fan bases are so, passionate we'll call it because what else can you do exactly just like it's, i'm it's inside miserable. i'm yelling about the jets i'm yelling about the pats i'm yelling about the eagles and then like it just it spreads across it's why like when mets and yankee fans show up and it's like oh it's spring and it's like right. shut up i went through the wars of the winter <laughs> yeah. sports what are you talking about well and it cracks me up right yeah. because you guys will then bag on miami fans for taking advantage of the fact that they don't have to do that like right. oh but you guys don't care enough and it's like right but if we care it's when part we of the care identity enough, though right, the but thing. then when we care enough when we care enough you're like oh but you're fair weather fans and it's like mm-hmm. hold on give me a break pick one yeah, uh, it cracks me up, man. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm I'm self aware about yeah, it as, I like as far it. as that's concerned. I'm able to recognize what it is while also dipping into my arrogant 
Northeast oh, Yankee ways. Don't get wrong. Times, I'll know? do the same thing, man. Oh, and good, also good. I was, I was raised a Yankee fan. So that's how, Ooh, okay. that's how that also like, and there's so, there's probably a bunch of us who were like same deal, right? My dad was born in Brooklyn and then moved uh, to okay. Miami when he was a kid. And so it's one of those, like I was a Yankee fan. I had Derek Jeter fathead in my room as I was a kid. I like to get the perspective of people outside of our little New York bubble on yeah. what the Knicks are doing. And obviously, you know, that, I will say you you're, I don't know. First of all, have you been able to disconnect yourself from fandom and like you're now part of like the media side? You're also like, this is a job, is but you're also, it's like a fun job. It's so, fun like, and weird. It's fun you, and weird. Okay. Yeah. It's, I, um, the answer is yes and no. Like I'm mm-hmm. capable of taking the fan hat off and, and doing analysis. Right. Um, I'm also very much capable, like allowed to still be a fan um, in the roles that I'm in. Like I work for a network that is team partners with, you know, no different than it would be working for, for MSG. Right. Like right. you're, 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 I mean, in there it's a little more intimate even, but with Valley, like we're team partners with the heat and the Marlins and the Panthers. So I don't have to pretend you know, our, our slogan is the heart of the fan. Like, mm-hmm. I don't have to pretend like I don't care deeply about these teams on the same token you know, my job is to give people perspective and to tell stories. Um, and so I try to be able to disconnect where I can so that I can look at things from an objective view and go, okay, realistically, where does the league stand? So I try to listen to a lot of other people's podcasts. I try to do a lot of things like, like honestly, listening to your podcast ever since mm. you reached out, I listened before our last go around with wow. the, the Knicks, right? Mm. So, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of get the gauge of where, local fans feel about their team if I'm going to do a game. And then otherwise it's mostly just kind of trying to tune into like national coverage of some of the the national brands that I do, you know, respect and some of those writers who cover the game and either listen to podcasts or read articles and kind of keep myself informed. So if if the follow up question is what are my thoughts about yeah, the Knicks what do you think about the Knicks? Going, yeah. I really think they're they're actually are really building something great. I think Jalen Brunson is is such a perfect Nick. Like he's just a great player and to add him to what they were already building. Like it's, it's a funky team. Um, and I do think (laughs) that like, I don't think that like this, I don't think whatever the final iteration of like the best version of this go around of the Knicks is, is going to look that similar to like what it is right now. I would think of the, you know, eight or nine guys who matter them. It'll be like three or four of those guys will ultimately be there when it's like the best version. You know, you can even look back at like the big three era when they had the big three, like that first team, that's not what it looked like by the time they won a title in year two. Like it wasn't even close with the role players, but I love, like, I think that, that Jalen Brunson is great. I think that RJ Barrett has a, a huge potential. And realistically, I think that, that, Julius Randle has proven a lot of Heat fans wrong. Heat fans wrong, yes. Well, I think specifically because there was a maniac who said that he was as good as Chris Bosh. His name is Brandon Tyranny. And, and he's a maniac. I, uh, yes, I'm not actually... Saying, yes, I, yes. I, he might be a w- lovely guy. I have no well, idea. No, never so met like, him. It, you'll, it was under, a, you'll be able to understand this. Yeah. Some of it is for the show. Yeah, like, I get it. I get it. Like that, no, that, I get it. That's more where I, the way I took that take. And that's you know? and that's where we all kind of, it's what I assume too. Most mm-hmm. of this is all a show. Like yeah. it's all it's all fun and hype yes. and we're just participating in a thing. And so but ever since like when that happened, I became like, all right, we're it's like I think all Heat fans are like, all right, anti Julius Randall mm-hmm. fan club, right? Yeah. And and he has been so sensational god specifically against the heat like he's been great i know they obviously defended him pretty well the other night but like he is on another level um and to watch him take that leap where i think it was he was one of those guys where he had one great year early in his career where after that he took a bit of a step back down and you're like oh okay that might have been a flash in the pan and to watch him round into the complete player that he is um it's been kind of, it's been as like a basketball fan it's fun to watch um so i do think that the knicks are like clearly headed in the right direction and i think what's great for them now is like they're set up mm-hmm. for the ability to now make a real move you know like that's yeah. the bigger thing 
if we're and, being completely honest. Like, and that's the sorry to interrupt you, but like no, please do. But that's the the biggest takeaway from this yep. season that is why when people bring up the Donovan Mitchell summer last year and like we my entire content schedule for the summer was like yep. well as soon as the draft's over as soon as free agency's over we knew Donovan Jalen Brunson was coming well it was like okay then we're done then the Donovan Mitchell stuff the Gobert trade happens and yep. it's like all right I guess Donovan Mitchell's happening there was a night and I I think we've rep- I think we've talked about this there was a night where the the minimal access and sources that we had said like hey like get ready he's going to be here tomorrow's the day and we we're like all Man. right like uh, there is in a recycle bin in a server somewhere in my computer a cover art for like emergency live stream yeah with donovan mitchell oh. being guarded by rj buried oh meant to be for for that and so like when that didn't happen there's there i know richard jefferson recently said this like been on the pod don't know how much of a friend of the pod he is but huh. um like it's a good thing the Knicks didn't get Donovan Mitchell because the league would have been over. In other words, like they should have done it. I know Stephen A again for the show is doing the thing of like, I'm going to say that this season's a failure. If you lose to Donovan Mitchell, which whatever the, oh, it, it got, clicks, it. it got eyeballs. I get it. Exactly. And just like from a realistic standpoint, I don't know what the timeline play, how the timeline plays out this season. If they do, go somewhat all in like is Emmanuel quickly the sixth man of the year they're just with a different the team right now man. Is, like does Julius Randall have this turnaround God, Emmanuel with, quickly so good so like they have all of so these good, dominoes man. that have there's fallen these fun this guys year, man you know? it, this is a fun team I, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you but it is it's it's there's a lot of really great um there's a lot of really great pieces on this team I mean even God the acquisition of Josh Hart like yep what a great move and like again how often like not to but how often are we saying that about the Knicks like no, what a true. great move it's like real. Again, it's, just, yeah. it's been a long time since I've been like yeah all right they're doing some stuff right Dude. and look for me I think it's fun I think yeah. it's fun when both the Heat and the Knicks are good it's better it'd be way better for everybody if like the next honestly neither of us want this to be what the ceiling is but if the next three years all the four or five matchups were Heat Knicks in the first round because both of these teams are just kind of punching and clawing mm-hmm. at each other in the Eastern Conference that'd be the best thing for the NBA like it'd be awesome if they're both really re- really solid defensive oriented playoff teams. Like that's what that's fun. Like, and so to me, I'm never mad when the Knicks look like they're going in a decent direction. Um, I always find it funny when people it's like, you don't really want your rival to stink. You don't, mm-hmm. you want them to be good enough so that you can beat them when it matters. Yeah. And that's, that's what I want. I want the Knicks to matter enough to then break their hearts. So then break you know? their hearts. Exactly. Yeah, that's, what I, now, that's what any fan should want. I will say no, the but if they make, they got some moves, some, man. Oh yeah, they well. So the moves are yeah. they're in pole position for Embiid is the way that I've been processing mm. how the season is. If the, the Sixers blow up, say they lose to a Miami Heat in the first round in the three yeah. six, right? And then Harden goes back to Houston, and Embiid asks out. Here's all the things we were going to offer for Donovan Mitchell, Dar- right. Daryl Morey. So like, as far as the Knicks are concerned, they're in a good spot. You mentioned you want your rivalry to be good. A lot of Knicks fans my age our inception into being Knicks fans is the late nineties when right. your rival was really good right. and you consistently broke their heart exactly. every year. So you get it like completely look, Giancarlo. I went on his show last week and he asked me like, is Knicks heat back? Like is the rivalry back? And I, my answer was like, there's going to need to be some playoff matchups. Like yeah. this Knicks Hawks thing has been weird. Cause it's one playoff matchup that Trey young, yeah. it's the only time he's ever performed well against the Knicks, by the way, like that that's guy. the only, like the Knicks are like, uh, like 11 and five against him in his career. And for yeah, some they, reason, this five own him series, too. And he just like, right. It's like the one game that he does go it's off. Bizarre. That gets highlighted, but right. then the games that he doesn't just completely get missed. But that at least became somewhat of a rivalry because it happened in the playoffs. The The timeline of a seven game series or a best of seven series that builds out the hatred for like, I hate you by game seven of that oh, series, for you know, sure, for sure. So that's where like, maybe this is the four five next year. Maybe it's the two, three in the mm-hmm. second round Be or awesome. one, four in a couple years. So I agree with you. That's how look this, this, this is closest we're going to get for now. This yeah. is this random Wednesday in the middle of March that already gets to the fun, end of March, man. you know, for the five seed. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Jeremy, Jer Bear, thank you so much for joining me here on the Knicks Film School pregame show. Before you go, please let everybody know where they can find you and all your stuff. 
First of all, thank you very much. This was a blast, and I hope I didn't ramble too much. I feel like I said oh, some things that were like kind of out there. So I hope people enjoyed it. I um, do wonder <laughs> the the crossover baseball to to the Knicks that Who knows? may come, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Sorry yeah. if I bored you guys, and if you're I did, good. you're probably not listening. So if you Mike are listening Sher right now, proud. Mike Sher would be proud. That's yes. for, and that's all I care about. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are listening right now, that means you enjoyed this episode enough that you might actually. <laughs> like listening to some of the things that I do. So um, you could follow me on Twitter at Jeremy Tache. That's at Jeremy T-A-C-H-E. It's on the screen here for those of you watching. Um, you could do that also on Instagram and TikTok, which I do now. Not a lot of I'm learning. I'm I'm uh, that I'm that I'm, weird age. I'm t- I'm 27. So uh, okay. I'm like I'm I'm at the end of millennials, technically on the borderline between millennial and Gen Z, but I'm not Gen Z at all. I'm super old. I'm uh, I'm super old. I'm 34. Yeah. So like TikTok, TikTok just, is foreign. Yeah, it missed. It missed I missed it. Yeah, I, I'm I, trying. I tried all it is is trying. I'm yeah. telling you, I'm just trying. Uh, As and, we've gotten like more into our socials and like yep. we got to make sure we do this, this, and this. Like I go to TikTok and it's like I I don't yeah I don't I'm, know what to do with uh, it. Technically, you know? I'm still not really doing anything other than putting clips of interviews up there. But if you uh, want to see go. those with some better captions than you would see elsewhere and on, you know, vertical edits. You can watch it on TikTok. <laughs> um, subscribe to Miami Miked Up. That's my podcast. Uh, I speak to someone either in sports media or on a team every week. Uh, it's either the Heat, the Marlins, the Panthers, um, or folks who are talking about them. And sometimes we have some random national journalists um, who join the show just to kind of chit chat about whatever's going on. Um, so that's my podcast. It's fun and you should listen and then yeah i'm also um on the dan levitard show with Stu gots so <laughs> you should listen to the podcast that we have over there where i'm sure <laughs> will be super nice to knicks fans yes they, they love new york over love there new york over dan there Le- dan levitard show we Stu love Gatz, it. Lo- new yorker that he's migrated literally south fans yeah. literally one of the people he's we what i'm talking, talking about. about he's what i'm talking about and he knows it Uh, He knows it too. But yeah, that's, that's all the stuff. I hope uh, you guys enjoy some of it and yeah, just be nice to each other. Yes. As someone who gets the show, I appreciate you making the time. And I, on behalf of probably just me, um, (laughs) I wish you and the, the the guys over at the Levitard show. Well, um, I don't, I'd say I wish you luck in this game on, on Wednesday. I you hope, don't, hope you're miserable. Yeah, yeah me I hope, too. I, I hope, hope you're you miserable lose. as well. Yeah, I hope yeah. all of you listening to this really hate your night on Wednesday. Yes, I hope all of all of the New Yorkers in, in Miami, I hope they're as loud as possible and make it known how loud they are after Perfect. that game was over. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for coming on, my man. Absolutely.